Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and um, just a couple things I want to mention. The first one is, we talked about this on Tuesday, um, my good friend and business partner Del Shroff is doing an amazing job with our weight loss program and has so much to share and he and I are going to do a conference call tonight, a class, it's sort of like a mini session, it's only $10 and you'll get to hear some of the new ideas we have. I don't think they're new ideas, I think they're good ideas. There's a difference between new and just getting it right, you know what I mean? But if you want to do that, call our office at 614-841-7700, they'll sign you up, give you the passcode and all that kind of stuff. Listen to what we have to say. I think you're going to find it really, really interesting. And then for those of you who are saying, gosh, there is so much, so many certification courses and advanced study classes and oh my gosh, I wish I could do it all. You can do it all. We've come up with this great annual pass program and um, it saves you a ton of money if you just pay one fee and you get to do it all. So anyway, if you want some information on that, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com and you can do our certification courses and our advanced study courses and all this stuff. A lot of this stuff is online and you can do it anytime and at your own pace and all that sort of thing. So um, let me know if you want to talk about it in some ways that we can uh, help you use the information too, maybe to help other people. All right, so I have gr um, really good news uh, to start with. Sometimes I have all bad news, <laughs> but today I'm going to start with good news. Most cancer deaths are preventable, which I've been saying for years, and a lot of you guys who are regular listeners know that, but according to a recent analysis, most cancer deaths could be prevented if people would make their diet and lifestyle habits better. Uh, the study included a large number, over 135,000 American health professionals. They were divided into two groups, and the low-risk group were people who met four criteria for a healthy lifestyle pattern, and that was defined as not smoking, no or moderate alcohol intake, one drink a day for women, two for men. I don't consider that moderate, by the way, um, but let's just go with it for now because the bigger issue is that it, it did um, result in a reduction. So no, no smoking, uh, no or moderate alcohol intake, uh, BMI between 18.5 and 27.5, and at least 75 minutes of vigorous exercise or 150 minutes of less vigorous exercise per week. So the, these people weren't knocking themselves out. This is not anything close to what we recommend here, but um, that was considered the low risk group. The high risk group were people who didn't do that stuff, all right? So during several years of follow up, subjects in the low risk group developed fewer cancers, not surprising. The researchers estimated that if the higher risk group people had done what the lower risk group people were doing, um, the incidence of cancer in the group would have dropped by between 25 and 33 percent, and almost half of the deaths from cancer in that high risk group would. Would have been prevented. Now one thing about the group is it was um, a group of health professionals and the researchers felt that their habits were better than most. I'm really not sure about that but again we're just going to go with it for the purpose of getting to the information here. So the researchers looked at the United States cancer statistics to evaluate the effects of healthy habits on cancer incidents and death in the overall United States Caucasian population. They determined that if all U.S. white adults can uh, just would adhere to the four criteria and not do any better than that, a 50% drop in cancer diagnoses would result, and uh, we would have 59% fewer cancer deaths in uh, women, and 67% of cancer deaths in men would be avoided. That's a pretty huge drop. A significant drop in particularly the incidence of lung, throat, kidney, liver, bladder, colon, and pancreatic cancers would be expected. And the researchers said a substantial cancer burden may be prevented through lifestyle modification. Primary prevention should remain a priority for cancer control. Well, no kidding, right? The researchers acknowledge that getting people to do this is difficult. Uh, study co-author Ming Yang Song said that a new field of study called implementation science is looking at how to translate research findings into action plans that lead to better outcomes. She encourages health professionals to ask questions about um, uh, to patients about their lifestyle, provide advice about changes that they should make, and monitor progress. She also says that we need some new public health strategies, and that's a lot easier said than done, but we really need to make it so that this is this is part of living. You know, people start to have some consciousness about this and we, we create environments that support healthy habits. 
In an accompanying editorial, researchers point out that the evidence is clear. Cancer results from environmental causes and most cancer is preventable. They report as many as 80 to 90 percent of smoking related cancers like lung and, and um, uh, esophageal cancer and 60 percent of lifestyle related cancers like colorectal cancer and bladder cancers are preventable. They write, and this is a great quote because so many people think it's all in the genes, but here's what they said. This large excess of cancer is not inevitable, but rather could be tackled by a broad range of interventions at multiple levels. They add, we have a history of long delays from discovery to translating knowledge to practice. They say we need to abandon the thought that cancer is a chance out occurrence and instead, quote, embrace the opportunity to reduce our collective cancer toll by implementing effective prevention strategies and changing the way we live. Um, they add that the best return on investment will actually come from prevention. Well, I really think that's true. And think how much lower the cancer incidence and death rate would be if people were doing what we tell our clients and members to do, which is a lot more than just those four habits. As for the motivation issue, here's what I think, here's what I know works from our experience here. Sharing information and research with patients that details outcomes that result from various choices is an incredibly powerful motivating tool. We've been training health professionals about this here at Wellness Farm Health for a long, long time. In other words, when you show people, look, if you get pancreatic cancer, let's look at the efficacy for treatment outcomes. If you get lung cancer, let's look at the efficacy for treatment outcomes. When you look at metastasized cancer, I mean, if, if you look at cancer treatment in general, over the last few decades, we really haven't made much progress at all. Localized uh, cancer has always been effectively treated with localized surgery, but if you have advanced cancer, we haven't got any better ideas today than we did 50 years ago. So um, you combine that with the powerful results of changing your diet and lifestyle habits to reduce the risk, and I think you can motivate the heck out of some people to do better for themselves. So um, I think we just find, I think we know how to share the information. I think the problem is trying to fit it into the existing medical model. I'm not sure it can be done. That's why we sort of stand over here at Wellness Forum Health on our own, doing our own thing and building a, a, a healthcare network that um, uh, gives people an option uh, apart from traditional care. All right, so let's go on to the next thing. I get a lot of questions about this, and it has to do with heavy metal toxicity and should you get tested for it, and there are doctors that think you should. So here's the story. It is true that there are several heavy metals like mercury, lead, and arsenic that are currently present in the environment, and it's true that some people have increased exposure to these types of substances, not just in the environment, but perhaps due to the work that they do. But it is not true that large numbers of people have health issues that can be attributed to metal exposure. In spite of this, there is a pretty large group of holistic and alternative health professionals that routinely diagnose what's called heavy metal toxicity in patients after administering tests that are actually questionable at best. Blood and urine tests, including something called the post-provocative urine test, are some of the most commonly used. And the post-provocative urine test is what we're going to talk about right now, and it involves giving a chelating substance to somebody and then measuring urinary output of metals. The problem with testing for metals is that since they are pervasive in our environment, almost all people have been exposed and store some in their tissues, but this doesn't mean that a person who has an illness got the illness or developed it in response to the exposure to metals. In fact, studies show that the use of chelating agents leads to increased urinary excretion of metals even in people who are healthy. Thus, the tests are unreliable and likely to cause more harm than to result in discoveries that lead to health improvement. An article in the Journal of Metal Toxicology confirms this, stating that provoked urine challenge should not be used to determine the burden of heavy metals as a basis for recommending chelation therapy. The article also notes that there's a great deal of potential for harm uh, to patients as a result of using this particular test. Now, there are several reasons why the tests are unreliable. One is that there's no standard reference range, which means that the interpretation of the results is always going to be subjective. There's no standard method of performing the challenge test. There are lots of different chelating agents, and some are administered orally, some intravenously. intravenously. There are varying amounts of time during which urine is collected, and there's limited evidence of a connection between past exposure to metals and uh, the results of provoked urine tests. One study 
study involving subjects with known mercury exposure concluded that challenge with the chelating agent DMSA was not useful as a marker of past exposure. And other studies show that almost all subjects will have increased urinary metal excretion if you give them a chelator, regardless of the extent of their previous exposure, their symptoms, or their present health status. The test is usually done in order to determine if a patient would benefit from chelation therapy, but according to the American College of Metal Toxicology, there is no research showing that the provoked urine test is accurate when used to identify patients who should benefit or would benefit from chelation. Now, it is true that there are people who have had damaging exposure to heavy metals, but the vast majority of the population hasn't. Health professionals who routinely screen all sick patients or even healthy patients for heavy metal toxicity using chelating agents find what they're looking for, which is essentially metal overload and justification for administering treatments, including chelation. But there's no correlation between these results and exposure, health status, and treatment outcomes. So testing for metals should really be limited to the tiny percentage of the population for which you have real reason to believe that there might be something um, wrong in the way of heavy metal exposure. And that brings me to the problem um, that I talk about all the time in medicine. Pick your branch. It can be naturopathy or homeopathy or traditional medicine, whatever. The problem is that if you only do this stuff, stuff meaning all the tools we have available to us, for the people who really benefit from it, you don't have a billion dollar industry. You only get rich if you can find a way to get everybody to do this stuff. So that's, we, we need to insert some reasonableness into this. Uh, by the way, a lot of you guys ask about this. Where do I find the references? I mean, these, these have, uh, this, the one on heavy metal toxicity has six references, you know, pretty well referenced articles. We post them in the Health Graves Library. They're posted by the time you see this. Um, and if you're not a subscriber, you can call our office and become one. And then you can have access to all of the articles in the library. I've been doing this for 20 years, and we have quite a collection there. All right, that's all for today and for the week, actually. So as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.